everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed. Today we are filming right here in Temecula, California at MD Expo. And joining me today to help me answer some of you guys' questions is Sean Malloy. Sean, thank you so Justin, much for joining thank me. Thank you so much for inviting me. So Sean is here to help me go over the hiring process and some of the things that he's looking for as a hiring manager. And a lot of these are questions that you guys have shot to me over the years, and I finally have somebody that's going to sit down, and we're going to get you the answers. So, Sean, can you please start out and tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're currently at and how many people you've hired over the years? Absolutely. So I've had a long career, and that's a key point I want to point out is the term career with the, the Biomed and HTM program. I started out in the military a long time ago, back in 1999, wow. and I found myself with TriMedics. I'm now the system director of the University of Chicago, and I you know, have found myself moving to accounts time after time where I had a significant labor that I had to hire, and I had, you know, I had to find a way of sourcing technicians but also bringing quality technicians in to fill those. And it's always been very successful. Has it also been a challenge to find, you know, a lot of those quality people? Because, I mean, there's always the mantra that the young people are lazy and stuff, which we know is not true, guys. So don't right. blow up, and we are not stereotyping anybody <laughs> here. I mean, everybody's an individual. I got senior technicians that are lazy, all right? Everybody has the potential to be lazy. So we're not, we're not going to get into that here, but uh, is it really complex finding somebody that's gonna stay with the institution for a period? So I, I think you said a key word and it's potential, right? As, as a leader, as a hire, we need to be able to see the potential in an employee. So when you come to an interview and you're actually interviewing, you wanna be interactive, right? You wanna bring material for the show that you have potential. One of my favorites is a my I Love Me book. Yeah, where yeah. you're going to sit down, show us your certification, show us what you can do, and you know, be active, be reactive, interview me. Okay. Right. One of my favorite things is to for them to ask questions about the company. Where are we going? What 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 are some of our goals? What are we looking for in a technician? You know, so that shows me, you know, that you're going to bring value to my organization. And that that goes a long way. Okay. Well, what about resumes? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to resumes, I, I tell people all the time, I see things that I call fluff. You know, uh, I tell people all the time when it comes to resumes, I myself want to see something that tells me who you are as a person and it's measurable. And, um, you know, I, I see all the time where people make this mistake where they say like hardworking, you know, experienced electronics technician, you can't measure that. Your experience versus mine are two different things. Mm -hmm. So by even adding those words, now I'm drawing it into question. What do you think about the intro paragraph and how do you think it's best for a junior biomed to word their intro paragraph because it is essential to telling us who you are? So it, it's one thing to show passion and it's another thing to show that you're being realistic, Okay. right? So you're looking for an entry level position to start your career and discover what you can do as a bio bet. And okay, and saying those words to provide value to the program. I want to learn how to provide value to the program with clinical engineering. So keep it realistic, okay. keep it unfluffy, but then, you know, actually be ready with examples. You know, right. We talk about measurable, right? Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite questions is tell me about a time where you, you know you did a repair or something technical that you're very proud of, okay, that's a good right? One. And if somebody says, ah, oh, this one time I repaired a teletransmitter and it's very simple and it's very basic, I'm gonna ask you why you were proud of that, right? Because I wanna see something major, something, right. an accomplishment. There might be a story behind it. Exactly. It, it might only seem like a teletransmitter, but maybe like you really saved the day on that one. Right. Who knows? And then my second favorite question is tell me about a time where things didn't go well. Okay. Where you made a mistake mm. and you had something to learn. Now, one thing that's going to show me is it's going to show me that somebody's humble and they're willing to share that experience, but it also shows that they, you know, what did they do? Did they grow from it? Did they find resolution or did they fluster and not develop from that mistake? Okay. Yeah, that's definitely going to be an important part of, you know, their future. 
Um, do you see where people don't want to admit their mistakes? Uh, is that a pretty common thing? Like they don't know of a time where they messed up? Yes, and, and I, you know, be careful about placing blame. Right. right. So one right. thing that is a red flag is when people start talking about how they didn't get along with the team and it was this manager's fault and uh, so yeah, on yeah. and so forth. Yeah. We're going to go over red flags because that, yes. I, I, I do think that's an important uh, topic and a lot of people mess this up. They really do. They do. Remember one thing. We're, we're here. You need to feel at ease. But this is also a professional conversation. Right. Right. So, you know, you want to keep it to that level and also make sure that you're you're impressing me. Right. You know, we're such a small career field that just because like company A and company B are 100 miles away from each other don't mean that those two guys are not best friends. Yes. So you really have to watch that. You might golf on the weekends with this guy that he's just talking trash about. And so now that you know that there's an issue between those two, an offline conversation is a phone call away, you know? You know, just a perfect <laughs> example just this week, of a friend of mine from Florida called me questioning three applicants who applied to him who he knew had worked in Chicago. Hmm. I knew them and I gave references for all three people. Interesting. I mean, when you come to these kind of events and you see just how many people know other people from around yes. the entire country, it's insane. It really is. I learned a lot by coming to these events to figure out how small this, this community really is. And it's a community. It's yes. not a career necessarily. It's a community. It's a bunch of people helping each other. So the other uh, question I have for resumes is uh, when it comes to formatting. I have mm. so many people that give me their, their resume and they're worried about the formatting. And for me personally, if you're a junior biomed, you're not going to have that much on there. No. So for you, how do you like uh, the formatting of a resume? What's the easiest for you to read? Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking for, uh, you know, it, it's different, like you said, from, from experience. So uh, an experienced biomed is very easy. You're going to list out the test equipment that you're certified on. You're going to list out the equipment that you're certified on and show your experience and value from that standpoint. Right. Now, from a new biomed out of school, you're, you're showing your education. And I'm telling you, put your senior project in there. Sure. I mean, I've your hobbies. Been, yes, your hobbies. And, and, and that, that's where I'm looking for that technical interest. What do you do in your free time? Do you take apart, you know, do you work on vehicles right. yourself? Do, do you, you volunteer? have that kind of, do you volunteer? Project Cure is a perfect example. So, but, but make sure you put that senior project. I have been so impressed by the work of senior project that they're doing in schools, but be detailed. What did you do? as part of that senior project, what were you in charge of, and then be prepared to speak about it. That's very cool. Um, so one of the other things that I've been talking about is modern day resumes, and what can you do to make your resume stand out from Joe Schmo that also applied for the same position. And one of the things that I did, I, I came up with something called a, um, an intro or a video resume, mm -hmm. you know, where there's a QR code in the upper corner. So I have my standard formatting, which is your name and your contact info, most important thing is updated information on your resume. And then I have a QR code up in the corner where I have like a little video intro that says, hi, this is who I am, and you know, this is the stuff that I've done. Just 30 seconds, like no longer, guys. How do you feel about people taking those extra steps to kind of uh, make a customized resume? I think it's an extra feather in your cap, uh -huh. right? You're going to take every possible, every possible step to set yourself apart, right? right? But I'll also create a warning there. Right, because okay. social media, you know, the, that if I can find you, I will. Right, right. Right. So if if you're applying for a position and you have LinkedIn connected to that resume, make sure it's up to date. That's right. Because if things, you know, you know, if I see good things in LinkedIn, then you know I'm going to think you're an organized guy and so forth. But if you're not keeping that kind of thing, you know, updated. You know, that, that speaks. It but also you're not participating in the community. Exactly. And <laughs> yeah. if you're not a member of LinkedIn, and I'm not going to promote LinkedIn or Facebook or anything else, but, but that's important. It really is because a lot of times I'm going to go there, see your connections, mm -hmm. and, and see how active you are, and it's just another dimension to you as a technician right. and chance to reach out to me. So absolutely. You know. So guys, remember that. If you are searchable, which every one of you is, especially you younger people that mm -hmm. social media is part of your culture, 
I can find out everything about you. In LinkedIn, if you are participating on that, don't get involved in politics. I say that all the time. 100%. Don't get in politics on there. No. Because everything you say and do on LinkedIn, we can see the history of it. Like, I can see all your posts, all your likes, dislikes, and stuff like that. We can see it. So if you're confrontational as a person, you can see it. They like to argue. Mm -hmm. Is that really somebody you want on your team? No. Probably not. Not at all. So mm -hmm. just to let you guys know, uh, you're absolutely right. If you're searchable in social media, we're going to do what we can to, to figure out what we can about you. It helps us uh, fill this position. This is a professional position that is potentially 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a long commitment. You yes. always have to take into account that somebody is going to be with you a long time. I mean, yes. it, that's what we would like. Yes. But very cool. So anyway, uh, we're, we're going to move on. We're going to talk about interviews because that's another thing that people always ask about. Professional interviews, what to expect from a biomed interview. When it comes to interviews, can you tell me what's one of the best interviews you ever had? Best interview I ever had was, um, number one, in person. Okay, I know right. that we've moved to kind of uh, a virtual interviewing process. You know, you should always push to do interview in person. Right. Um, if it's an option. If you do have to interview uh, remotely, make it appropriate. Make sure you're dressed appropriately. Mm -hmm. Try to avoid interviewing from your car. I've interviewed people's <laughs> foreheads several times. Wow. So, you know, be prepared. That's amazing. You know, provide a professional stance. But I'll tell you, one of the best interviews I ever had was actually for a young technician. He sat down and immediately started selling himself to me. Okay. Right? It was a sales. He was, of course. this is who I am. This is what I'm able to do. This is why I'm so interested in joining your company. He talked about my company. He went on the, the internet and did research and was able to tell me about my company, which showed he had interest. He had his I Love Me book, which talked about all the certifications he had that showed that he had confidence in himself. Right. And then finally, at the end of the interview, he looked at me and he said, is there any reason why you think I am not qualified for this position? Because I would like to take a moment to you know, explain or maybe handle that um, right. that issue, and That's I amazing. loved it because I said, well, you know, maybe I feel like you need a little more experience. So could you take a minute and tell me how you're going to overcome that shortcoming? And he did. He had something to cover that. So that's his second chance. It's his second chance. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and own that second chance. Because sometimes as an interviewer, I can tell some, when somebody's a bad interviewer. Okay. Right? They get clammed up. And I'll stop the interview and say, hey, listen, how do you think this interview is going? <laughs> and, and, if, and that's not to be rough on Not you. at all. That's it's to, to give rough. you that chance. Right. right. Hey, I want you to take a breath and let's restart. Okay. Right. But not everybody's going to give you that opportunity. Yeah, they could just walk you out the door. I'd right. be like, okay, sir, we'll get back with you. And have you ever walked away from a situation saying, man, I should have said that, or if I could have done this again, I could. That is your opportunity. Wow. That's amazing. So now that that's your best interview, what's one of your worst interviews? Mm. Now, I mean, uh, everybody's got stories about their worst because mm -hmm. you have no real concept of how bad some candidates really can be. So yes. what's your worst? So my worst, um, I would have to say, is the, number one, show up late. Oh, punctuality. Oh, okay. my number one pet peeve. Show up late. In, in, you know, if you're not 15 minutes early, you know, it, it's an issue. It does set a perception. Uh, number two, dress professionally. Okay. Dress professionally like you're applying for a career, not a job, right? right. You're applying for a way of life, right? Um, s secondly, for, for this interview in particular, you know, the person was very stagnant. They were not interactive. You know, they okay. just sat there. And then when they we asked- They put it all on you? They did. Okay. So the entire interview was on me. And what that tells me is eventually I'm going to have to micromanage this individual, right? You're, you're, you're not right. self-motivated. And finally- do not over exaggerate your abilities because I'm going to call you out on it. Right, right. right? We can so sense the BS. We can, we can. And you know, some of, I, I know how to work on an MRI and then at the interview, it turns out that you just worked with somebody else on an MRI. Right. So be honest, right. be honest. You have skills, you have value, bring those things to the table. Right, I mean, if you're interested in, in something, 
Also, I tell people all the time, like, it's, it could hurt you if you say, eventually, I want to get into imaging. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say that. Yes. And, and I've, I've I, I, if you really want to eventually go into imaging, more right. power to you. We'd love to help you down the road. Yes. But you might limit yourself on, on your career opportunities. That's, be, be realistic. Right. Right. And if, if you do have an interest in imaging, instead of saying, hey, in two years, I'd like to be imaging, flip it around and say, hey, you know, how long does it take for me to develop into this or into that? What are right, my right. options five years down the road? Right. Ask that question That's because I feel like you're, you're, you're invested in me. You're right. actually looking you're at my program in the future, right? right? So, yes. Yeah. That's awesome. So what do you think are some of the red flags that immediately stand out when you start an interview with somebody? Mm -hmm. Uh, so some of the red flags is, and, and, and I'll tell you, uh, short, short work history. Okay, spotty, okay. jumping from location to location right. a lot in the beginning of your career. Um, it, it's typically a red flag for us if you spend a year or two year, you know, less than two years at any given organization. We're going to ask you what happened here. Sure. If you can get in the door, okay? Now, and I understand some things are going to be out of your control. You, there can be some project work, some contract work, some things can change. But, you know, if you have to move to be promoted, outstanding. That's a good reason to jump from place to place. Right. But if you're a biomed one at one place for a year and another place for a year and another place for a year, that shows a lack of, of commitment or maybe patience Gross. to develop, right. and it is a big red flag. Interesting. I, you know, I, I myself have a vast majority, I have a whole selection of hospitals that I've worked for, but every single time, like, I was responsible for something, now yes. I'm responsible for something bigger, and, you know, I've opened, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, you know, towers and stuff, and uh, every time it's a growth. Sometimes I actually had to step back. Like when I moved from Charleston, South Carolina to Houston, I had to go from being a team leader at a very respected medical university to being a Biomed 3. Yes. And, and that's okay because it got me to a new location though. Right? Well, and you brought up a good point about putting quantitative information into your resume, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, that might be a little bit of a red flag, but if you put measurable information into your resume, that's gonna get you in the door. And then if you ask that question, is there anything that concerns you about me that I could address? And I could say, well, it looks like, you know, your, your work history is kind of short. You could say, yes, but let me share with you why it is the way okay. it is. And you've completely handled that issue. I would have no problem with okay. that. Okay. That's, that's an interesting one. I, I personally can say that I've been afraid that, you know, and I've had people tell me that it's, it's going to be damaging, but at the same time, it doesn't seem that way. Because, I mean, my career has, has gone just up and up and up. The thing is, is like, are you going to put in the effort? Are you going to talk about, like, right. how you're going to contribute to your new team? Yes. Um, those are all things that I do when I interview. But uh, And let me explain. A red flag is a flag. It's not a door. Okay. Right? So as interviewers, we also have to be willing to be equal and op offer the opportunity. You know, one thing I'm very well known for is I'll interview just about anybody. Okay, because I want that moment to sit with you, hear your story, and get an idea of what your potential is. Right. Very cool. Now, what, what's your opinion on fast burners? Now, fast burners, guys, that's somebody that proceeds through the ranks maybe a little bit faster than they should. It, it does happen. Some people honestly deserve it. Mm -hmm. They are some of the hardest working people. Some people treat our career field like it's politics. Um, it obviously it depends on person to person. Now, how do you feel about fast burners? And uh, I mean, obviously, if you see somebody that's like management in like three years, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I mean, but how do you feel about it? So I always say right place, right time, right person, right? So I would say a fast burner who develops very quickly and is the right place, right person mm -hmm. is the anomaly, right? Is, is the exception. They exist. Right, sure. But... You know, you you have to, you know, you have to really um, be at the right time. I've had several opportunities. I have developed very quickly, but I had a lot behind me with the military. Right, right, same. But I had an opportunity to move to a management position at a hospital, and when I looked, I stopped, and I said, it's not the right time. Right. 
right? So you can get in over your head. Exactly. And, and like we said in the beginning, this is a small career field. It's entirely possible that you could also damage your career irreparably mm -hmm. because you get a bad image. And no. there's a philosophy that we are always promoted one level higher than our competency, yes. right? So eventually, you know, you're a great tech, so you should be a great manager. You're a great manager, so you should be a great director. You're a great director, so you should be a great VP. Uh, we kind of overextended you, right. right? But it's you are the custodian of that, right? right. If so, it's great that somebody believes you. Um, uh, success is not a guarantee; it's an opportunity, right? That's right. So make, you know, it's great. It's, it's an opportunity to make more money. It's an opportunity to have more responsibility and grow your career, but don't overgrow. Take your time and make it at the right time. I agree. Because you're right. You bruise your reputation in this, this field and it could affect you for a much longer term. So here's something, uh, something that people ask me all the time about. When it comes to training, would you rather wait and hire somebody that's trained exactly on what you need them to be, or would you rather hire to train yourself or, or to customize their growth? So this is, I love this topic because, you know, as, as somebody who's hiring, do I wait 10 months to find the technician I'm looking for when I could have built that technician if I would have right. hired in the beginning, right? And, and you know, if I put that kind of training into somebody, you know, trying to keep them and invested and so forth, I have a large organization and I feel that I have the responsibility to be an inlet to our career field. Right. 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 So if, if I hire and I have turnover of five or six technicians every two years, but they stay within our career field, that is my responsibility to introduce and be a conduit to our, our career field. Okay. So, you know, like I said, I interview everybody and I think it's important, especially now, for those who have the ability to train and mentor to do so. Right. And, you know, as, as senior techs and, and, and as leaders in this organization, we need to understand that we have a responsibility to mentor. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, to be honest. Um, now, one of the other things that I tell people all the time is if there's a specific company or a specific uh, location that you're looking for, mm -hmm. first, I reach out to everybody on LinkedIn that's there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the number one thing. But if you have to go the route of going through HR, and there's, let's say, a Biomed 2 position, and you're Biomed 3, but it says Biomed 2, mm -hmm. I tell people apply anyway. Yes. Absolutely. Just, I mean, just, just go for it. Yes. I mean, because... Salaries are negotiable. Yes. If you are the man, if you are the candidate that they are waiting for, especially if it's going to save them maybe time or money, then, then they're going to move people around within their organization. Yes. I've seen it happen. I've, they've done it for me before. So people, people say that, oh, the description doesn't match me. I'm not going to apply. So let me, let me give you another, another look at that as well, okay. right? Because throughout my career, I have stepped back in, in position several times. When I left the military to be, you know, join the private sector, I joined as a Biomed 1. It was my okay. foot in the door. Right. But I advanced very quickly. Now, I often interview people who are three, right? And they're just an entry, like just over the, the top of being a three. But I was like, why don't I put you in two? Because let me tell you what you're giving up, right? You're giving up a higher pay increase when that promotion comes. That's, and not to put any percentage on it, but typically a 10% increase that you're giving up, right? So I can give you this salary and give you the position of a two, or I can give you around the same salary and give you the position of a three. Right. And you're going to get a 3%, 3.5 merit increase every year, mm -hmm. and you're going to miss out on that 10% that you could have got as part of a promotion. Right. So positions, I get the idea of positions, but if you come in, prove yourself and get that promotion, you're you're going to get a 10 percent increase in, in, you know, and not the three point five. OK, so don't give that up. I mean, just to have the three. Right. Right. Which a lot of people get stuck on that. They do. But I, I tell people just go for it, even if it's a biomed one, you're a biomed three. Yeah. Just apply. That way there, your resume crosses somebody's desk. Yep. 
And as soon as somebody finds out that, hey, this guy with these capabilities wants to be part of our team, you know, that's your, that's your foot in the door. Yes. And that's it. So uh, while we're talking about biomed levels, this is also a, an important one that people ask me all the time. Uh, when it comes to your biomed level, do you think it's more important for your biomed level to be related to your skill set or your tenure? So, <laughs> see, I know, I know how this one can burn. So, and, and I'm going to flip back to the military on this piece, right? So, in the military, we have privates to sp in the army. Mm -hmm. uh, we have privates to specialists, mm -hmm. right? Now, the specialists are kind of our workhorses, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you do your time as a private, you will eventually become a specialist, right? And I think from the position of biomed one to biomed two. I would lean more of the time if that's a tenure kind of situation. But a gentleman could spend, or a gentleman or a lady in the military could spend their entire career as a specialist, mm -hmm. okay? There is a certain talent, tact, leadership that we are looking for to be a Biomed 3. You could, right. in, the pay scale is much larger for the two. We can in, continue to increase your pay, but to give you the designation of Biomed 3, and really open up that pay scale, you've got to show your value. Right, right. Right, so at a biomed, that, that one to two level to get you to the workhorse you know, side of things, I really think that is a more time issue. Okay. But to get you to a three or a senior technician or up into management, those are definitely skill-based. Interesting, those are good answers. So here's the thing. What are some of the best qualities you look for in a candidate? When, when you get all these resumes, what are, what are some of the qualities that you're looking for in your team members? Okay. So I'm looking for a multitude of qualities. And that's one thing I can tell you know, those hiring managers out there is diversify your staff. Right? Okay, that's if, a good one. If, you hire, if I hired a bunch of people that were exactly like me, in two years I'm going to have a shop full of managers or people <laughs> that want to be managers. Oh, right? boy. We have to yeah. look for different, diverse people who have multiple skills who help form a good team, right? So the qualities that I'm always looking for is somebody who's looking for a career. Okay. Somebody who's looking to self-improve over time. They just continue to want to self-improve. Somebody who has the heart to be a biomed, right? No matter what, from a technical standpoint, the one thing that all excellent biomeds, imaging engineers, and leaders have in common is the heart to do what we have to do when we have to do it. The past two years has showed us that with COVID. Mm, that's we true. still showed up, we still did our jobs, right. and we did it extraordinary. Because I can tell you, I can teach technical skills. I can teach troubleshooting. What I can't teach is passion. Right. That's very true. So if I feel that passion, that is one of the most important things. And second to that is the ability to work as a team. Those are amazing answers. Wow. Well, guys, I'm going to be going, I'm going to take more questions after this video. Go ahead and write me in the video description down below. If there's a part of the topic that we didn't, weren't able to cover in this, this short period of time, go ahead and write me below and I'm going to see if we can maybe create a second video in the future because you guys write me all the time and I try and keep records of some of the stuff that you guys ask me because I'm going to sit down with an industry expert and we're going we're gonna to hash this out and we're going to put it on record formally for you guys. So, Sean, thank you very much for your thank time, you, man. Justin. I appreciate it. This is an amazing opportunity, guys. If you made it here to Temecula, to the MD Expo, good on you. I have met some amazing people here. We, we had a good time. There's awesome. like over a thousand people this was an amazing event, and a lot of young people showed up, which is very encouraging for Southern California. And Justin, let me just caveat on one thing. If you are a college student, if you are trying to enter this field, go to your local clinical engineering association, join, come to these conferences, rub elbows, bring your resume, and network in this community. Right. This, this is you know, a small community, but at the same time, if you are trying to get in and you want some help, we're a community. I say that in every one of my videos because it, it is a career, but it's a community. We help each other, which is why I'm doing this on my free time, which is why Sean's contributing, helping do this. He, he's going to do his own thing coming up soon. And, and when he does, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> and, and I'm going to go ahead and highlight some of those in my social media posts because 
everybody has something to contribute yes. and we just want to all contribute to this project so that the knowledge is shared around the world. This isn't just a United States problem. It's not a California problem. It's not a Texas problem. It's a worldwide problem and we're here to help you guys solve these problems. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. My phone's blowing up. This, is, this always happens. Every single one of my videos, my phone goes off. So thank you guys for watching and stay tuned. We're going to keep you updated on Sean's future projects for time management, some cool stuff, I promise you. See you next time, guys.